The name of this video is Line Integrals. Supposed to have a three dimensional region of space, which, as always, we call capital Omega. Suppose that in this region of space we identify a generic line gamma, which is oriented and it goes from point M to point N. This line, as I said, is oriented, so that's oriented from M to N. This is our line gamma. Suppose now to identify a discrete set of points along this line. M coincides with point capital P1, then somewhere uh, here, for example, there will be a point capital P um, 2. Somewhere here, there will be a point uh, capital P 3. Eventually here, there will be a point uh, P capital P K minus 1, a generic index. Here, a point capital P K. And here, a point capital P N minus 1. And finally, N coincides with capital P N. So we have a discrete set of points. Supposed to connect these points by means of straight lines, which sort of uh, approximate this continuous line gamma with a, with a series of segments attached to each other. So this one will be the first segment, which we call L1. This one will be the second segment, which we call L2. This will be the segment connecting k minus 1 with ka, so it's l factor k minus 1. And finally, these two points are connected by means of l vector n minus 1 until we reach point n. So these segments approximate my continuous line gamma. Suppose, in addition, that this region of space lives in an external vector field A, such that this vector field has the following values. For example, it has a certain values A1, a point capital M, or P1 if you want. It has a value A2, and these are all vectors, a point P2. A P3 is a value P3, for example, a point uh, uh, PK minus 1, it has a value A, vector k minus 1, and at point n minus 1, it has a value a vector at n minus 1. So in this case, with this approximation, we have a line gamma, which is approximated by a series of segments in an external vector field a. We can write the following series, t n given by the sum for k that goes from 1 to capital N minus 1, we end up at n minus 1, of the product between the value of the vector field A, the generic point k, dotted with L at k. Now, suppose to go in the limit for capital N that goes to infinite. In this case, what happens here is that, under these conditions, Lk, which is a vector, effectively becomes a dl vector, an infinitesimal quantity. So we are trying to go to represent this line first with uh, uh, a discrete set of uh, segments, okay? and in order to approximate better this line, we reduce the length of the segments, okay, increasing the number of points in the line until effectively we uh, get the original line gamma as close as possible. So what is dl? 
So for example, uh, let's uh, consider a point P here. This is my point capital P, a generic point P, and this is in the neighborhood of an infinitesimal element of length VL. So here we can define a tangent unit vector, which is directed along the tangent to line gamma at point P, and we can normalize it to one, and we call this T vector is a tangent unit vector. So tangential to gamma at point capital P of unit value. So this is a unit vector as always, okay? Unit vector, P. So, so far we encountered two types of unit vectors. N, small n vector, was the normal unit vector to a surface. Small t vector is the tangent unit vector to a line. Okay, so with this in mind, we can uh, write VL as a direction, which is that of a t unit vector, times the amplitude, which is that of the neighborhood, so VL in this case. Under these conditions, if this series uh, under this condition converges, we manage to go from a discrete series to a continuous series, which is nothing but an integral. And this it converges, this series we call it T gamma, which is defined as the line integral along line gamma of the vector field A at each point P dotted with T dL. So this is the first result of this video, the concept of line integral. Great. So now that we have in our hand a good suitable definition of line integral, what happens if uh, instead of having an open line, say we have a closed line? So this is our closed line gamma. But in this case, instead of writing down a line integral, we can write down a circulation along gamma, which we define as the line integral on a closed line. So I have this loop, gamma of A dot P dL. So this one is the circulation. We will use both extensively in 242 and 342. So this one is the circulation. Circulation of a field. All right. So now that we have also the definition of circulation, we can derive our first key theorem. And so the theorem that I'm about to prove is called the rotational property of a generic field. TR or property of a generic field A. So how do we prove this theorem? Note that this theorem is an if and only if condition, that this is a, a necessary as well as a sufficient theorem kind of condition. Okay, so let's prove only uh, one of them. You can try to prove the other way around, to get if and only if. And so let's hypothesize that the line integral on a line gamma prime of A dot TDL is equal to the line integral on a line gamma double prime of A dot TDL. And let's hypothesize that this is true for each pair, arbitrary pair of lines gamma, gamma double prime in region omega. So this has to be true for any possible pair of infinite lines in this region omega, for each possible pair of lines. Okay, so I can pick two any points I want, these two points, I do this line integral or this line integral in this direction, or I pick these two points and I do this line integral, this line integral, or I pick these two points and I do this line integral and this line integral. Okay, it doesn't matter, it has to be true for all of them. If this is the case, then this is equivalent to say that the circulation of A, the TDL, along any possible line gamma in omega is equal to zero. In this case, the field is said to be irrotational. 
Okay, how do we prove that the field is irrotational? The proof is relatively simple. So let's start with one half of the proof. And again, I will let you do the other half. So the way we do this is, uh, uh, for example, let's consider a point M here and a point N here. And let's consider that this one is line, let's say that this one is line gamma prime, and this one is line gamma double prime, both directed from capital M to capital N. Eventually, together, they form a closed line, but remember that now they are directed both towards capital M. So if that is the case, we are assuming that, by hypothesis, the Milan integral on gamma prime of A dot TDL is the same as the line integral on gamma double prime of A dot TDL. Okay, so this is equivalent, obviously. We said the integral on gamma prime, and now on I will skip the integral, it's over A dot TDL, minus the integral on gamma double prime has to be equal to zero. But this is actually also equivalent to say that uh, what we can do, we can bring this minus sign into gamma double prime and write this as the integral on gamma prime plus the integral on minus gamma double prime equal to zero. But now, if you go to this uh, sketch here, we notice perhaps that if this, I keep gamma prime in this direction, but I'm flipping the direction of gamma double prime, so this line in red, which goes from N to M, this one in this direction is minus gamma double prime. And you may notice that this remains gamma prime. So the union of gamma prime and minus gamma double prime is actually a closed line gamma, which is the overall red line here, okay? This overall red line, I call it gamma, constructed by means of this rule down here. So effectively, we have just proven that, according to this, the line integral and closed line gamma is equal to zero, okay? And you can prove that vice versa. If this is true, the closed integrals of the circulation is equal to zero, this also has to be true. And in fact, this, what this tells us, it tells us that in this case, the vector field A is a state function. Uh, that is, the integral depends only on the limits of integration. So we only care about M and N. It's independent from the way I go there. So I could go with a straight line, I could go with a, a very complicated line like this, or I can go with a line like that, I get always the same result, independent from the line of integration, dependent only as a state function from the extreme, the limits of integration. Okay, an important corollary to this theorem is that uh, if we consider, in addition to um, an, an, an extra topology requirement to this theorem, we add an extra topology requirement. So let's say that we define uh, our omega or any domain in space to be of the following shape. Something, for example, like this. Okay? Let's call this one our capital omega. Okay? Such a domain is called simply connected. It's said to be simply connected. or a star domain. So this is a simply connected or star domain. A domain like this instead, so similar to the one I just sketched, but let's suppose that here, any point within this domain is part of the domain, whereas here, let's open a little hole like that, so that only this point are part of the domain. So we remove the hole, we punch the hole in the domain, in this omega prime. Okay. As it turns out, if I consider here um, any closed line gamma, and I try to shrink it down to a point, I will never abandon the domain while I shrink it down to this point. Whereas in this case, if I consider this line gamma, when I try to shrink it down, eventually I will exit the domain. Of course, for this line gamma here, I will not. 
because it does not enclose the hole which I punched here. But here I do. And so in that case, the domain is said to be not simply connected. There is a fundamental theorem in calculus, which is called Poincaré's lemma. So according to Poincaré's lemma, according to Poincaré's lemma, if a vector field A is irrotational and is also defined in a simply connected domain, so not this one, well then the field not only is irrotational, but is also conservative. The field is said to be conservative. So an irrotational field in a simply connected domain is conservative. Uh, a conservative field is always irrotational. An irrotational field not in a simply connected domain is not always conservative. Now in this course, we will only consider scenarios where we have an irrotational field in a simply connected domain, therefore it's always conservative. So we can confuse ourselves, we can confuse the definition of irrotational and conservative for our purpose, for all practical purposes in this course will be the same. But there are some examples, even in electromagnetism, important examples, which we will cover in a graduate course, where an irrotational field is defined in a non-simply connected domain and therefore is not conservative. Okay, we will discuss about this when we will discuss about the electrostatic potential a little bit more in detail. Okay, so the whole point of this video was to define a structure of line integrals, which we did by means of a series. So we started with a continuous line, which we first approximated with discrete segments together, and we defined this dot product, which defines in the limit of when we try to re, uh, to re obtain the continuous line, a line integral. We also defined the constant of circulation. We then uh, demonstrated, part, partially at least, the uh, theorem, which is called the irrotational property of a vector field A. And we have demonstrated that if a field is irrotational, the integral does not, of any line integral of this field, depends only on the beginning and the end, uh, on the limits of integration, not on the way we get uh, to these limits. And finally, I also uh, said that if I have an irrotational field in a simply connected domain, the field is conservative. All right, and so uh, I will see you in the next video, which is going to be about the uh, irrotational property of the electrostatic field.